other fleet units were slugging it out. This was the softening up process to prepare the way for our amphibious landing forces. Organized kamikaze attacks by the suicide boys had not yet started, but watch this one crash on a ship. Jap pilots could twist and turn with the greatest of ease in plane from the Franklin. It was usually scratch one meatball. Rocket-equipped planes played havoc with Jap shipping. They struck like lightning and seldom was there need for any more working over. Planes by the hundred and ships by the score were accounted for by the task force of which the Franklin was a part. Now the kamikaze boys were in earnest. They were deliberately trying to crash on any ship they could. They got plenty of assistance in crashing. But they were persistent and kept boring in. Often they were too close for comfort. One day, four of them started at once. Two were shot down, the third just missed, but the fourth kept coming. Coming at 300 miles an hour and finally crashed on the flight deck. This sent the Franklin back to the States for major repairs. And just four months later, we pick up her saga as she draws up to Ford Island at Pearl Harbor. She didn't create much fuss, only one small band played Aloha. The real welcome was tendered by a party of 50 waves, a glee club, by the way, who were shown around the ship. They stayed for the awarding of combat decorations to a returning air group. The presentation was made by Vice Admiral Murray, commander of aircraft in the Pacific. Air Groups 75 and 35 came aboard for refresher exercises in the Hawaiian area. These combat teams and our own Air Group number 5 needed some sharpening up and were going to get it. The deck of a carrier is roughly divided in thirds. At the bow is fly 1, center fly 2, and fly 3 at the stern. Fly officer 1 signals takeoffs. Look out there, if you step on those brakes too hard, you'll wind up on your nose. And this signal means, rev it up, more speed. Distance changes the towering bulk of a carrier to a slim, graceful ship streaking through the water at 28 knots. The greater her speed, the easier she launches her planes. The white diamond on the wings and tail surfaces identifies the plane as belonging to the Franklin. When coming in for a landing, that carrier deck, 80 by 800 feet, looks like a very small postage stamp on a very big ocean. Setting a fighter plane on a carrier deck is a trick not learned overnight. It takes at least two men, the pilot and the LSO, the landing signal officer. He's a veteran pilot who knows both the plane and his ship. When the approach is not to his liking, he says, keep going and try again sometime. The LSO actually nurses every one of those planes down to a perfect landing with body English, a few prayers, and the mandatory signal with the right hand paddle, cut your engine, to a perfect landing as the arresting gear grabs the tail hook. His opinion of some approaches would blister the ears off the pilot concerned if he could hear it. Cut but up on her nose into the barrier and a new propeller needed. Exercises over, we were on our way back to Pearl. The Airedales, which is Navy slang for flyers, had little to do but sunbathe. That night, there was a party aboard. The guest of honor at the executive table 
was fortunate enough to pull the brass ring on the merry-go-round of flying carrier-based planes and make the 9,000th landing on the deck of the Franklin. Ensign Graff was to make many more fast takeoffs and hurried landings before the story of the Franklin was committed to its log. Morning quarters on a flat top flight deck is a colorful set of loud colored jerseys for quick identification with their jobs. Red shirts are fueling crews, yellow shirts are plane directors, and blue shirts armorers who load the planes, guns, and bombs. The minute the ship left port, neckties were dropped along with many other formalities of dress and behavior. The enlisted men wore dungarees and the traditional white hats were dyed blue. However informal the dress, the standards of smartness and cleanliness were still high. Any man who stood inspection needing a haircut got his orders fast and the haircut too. When the executive officer was satisfied that things were ship shape the tour ended and everyone off to his station. The refresher exercises were coming to an end. When we were within a few hours of Pearl Harbor, air groups 35 and 75 were ordered to their shore fields. They took off a lot more smartly than they did when we first joined up together. Now they were flying teams, integrated, used to each other and to our ship. They saw Diamond Head long before we did and headed for the Naval Air Station at Kaneohe. Supplies and stores had to be taken aboard, the thousands of varied items needed to stock a floating airfield for weeks to come. The facilities available for rest and recreation in the Hawaiian Islands have long been world famous, and our flyers took proper advantage of them. The wonderful surf bathing at Waikiki, and shooting the beach on mile-long rollers in native outrigger canoes. Finally, when all supplies were aboard, everyone packed his gear and leaves for all hands were ended. The Franklin was on her way again to rejoin Task Force 58, with escort vessels alongside and her own planes overhead to spot any trouble or interference. She was steaming to Ulithi. Ulithi. Not too long ago, these protected waters were filled with the Imperial Japanese Navy. Now it was America's secret weapon of the Pacific War, an anchorage large enough to hold the most powerful armada of warships in history. The fleet that had come to stay. The spearhead of our Pacific strategy was implemented with these fleet units, formed into task groups, they had prepared for and covered all our island landings and now are ready to sortie to the very door of the Japanese home islands. We were to be part of the with us in a raid on shore installations on the Japanese island of Honshu. The main Japanese islands were four days journey from Ulithi. We were on our way. At three minutes before seven on March 19th, less than 100 miles from Honshu, the Franklin's planes took off into a heavily overcast sky. We were making 24 knots. A sixth of the crew was at breakfast when we got a message from the Hancock that they saw a twin-engine Jap medium bomber. Our plane started looking for him, but he slipped down out of a cloud and laid two 500-pound bombs on our flight deck. 45 of our planes were aloft, but there were 31 on the flight deck and 22 on the hangar deck, fully gassed and armed. The first heavy vapor explosion enveloped the stern in flames. We turned into the wind to keep the fire and smoke astern. The Jap bomber had pulled up from his bomb run and was streaking for home when the leader of Air Group 5 got him and shot him down. The flight of the Franklin was probably best described by one of our returning flyers. I was with the first squadron. Just before we got over the target, my oil line let go. So I had to nurse a crippled plane back home. I tried to stay in the clouds because I couldn't outfly a Seco. 
When I broke through the overcast, I saw flames shoot hundreds of feet above the Franklin and a 2,000-foot column of smoke. It looked awful bad, but she still had some headway. I got permission for an emergency landing on the Hancock. The fire raged as bombs, rockets, and small caliber ammunition continued to explode with increasing violence. station was wrecked by the first blast and its personnel knocked out. So the firefighting had to be taken up by emergency parties. Water pressure was good for a while, but fires on the hangar deck soon severed the line. Those were responsible for a great many casualties. Hospital corpsmen and first aid crews were as busy as those fighting the fire. With both elevators knocked out, first aid stations had to be set up on the forward area of the flight deck. In this scene of chaos, when the instinct for self-preservation should have been uppermost, dozens of selfless heroes were born. The Franklin's crew was writing a magnificent page in the history book of naval disaster. The first explosions blasted members of the flight deck crew overboard. One crewman tells this story. I had just finished breakfast and come up on deck. That's all I remember till I found myself in the water swimming. I didn't have any uniform on. Couldn't seem a ship for smoke. She seemed to be blowing herself to pieces. The amount of water poured on the fire caused a decided list to starboard. We knew that news of our trouble would soon reach the enemy. So gun crews were at stations for all available weapons. We didn't have long to wait. Even though we were flanked by our own ships, the Franklin was a sitting duck. And here's what happened to one attacker. Santa Fe came alongside, pouring all the water she could pump. We managed to get some of our wounded transferred. The Franklin was now dead in the water because engine spaces had to be evacuated on account of smoke, and the only power we had was from one forward emergency diesel generator unit. The destroyer Hughes stood by the stern and took stretcher cases off the fan tail. These men had been marooned below the burning flight deck for about four hours. Several decks below the waterline is an emergency steering station. Report of what happened there. I was the quartermaster on watch. We realized from the time of the first explosion that our ship was hurt, maybe finished. Soon we were trapped by water pouring down. We had one phone line to the bridge. That's how we steered the ship. They told us to hang on. They would get us out somehow. They did, 18 hours later. With the compartments flooded to even her keel, a tow line was passed to the Pittsburgh. Twelve hours after the tow began, the Franklin started under her own power. She had been hurt by the enemy and buffeted by fate. She had drifted a hulking wreck incapable of movement to within a few miles of the Japanese coast. But now she was steaming under her own power, manned by her own crew. As soon as decks could be cleaned, the survivors met in prayer for those less fortunate.
A few days later, we anchored near the hospital ship Mercy. A number of the Franklin's crew, some of them still on litters, were ferried over to the Mercy. There, with quiet efficiency, the Navy's medical department took over tasks for which the Franklin's sick bay was never designed. In such a hell as the men of the Franklin lived through, more than flesh can be seared. There are sights to be forgotten, experiences which must be erased from the memory. These are the things a chaplain must help them to accomplish. At 10.30 on March 25th, within sight of the hospital ship Mercy, a Thanksgiving and memorial service was held on the flight deck for the full ship's company. The skipper, Captain Garys, concluded the memorial ceremonies with a short talk which added up to, well done. A survey party began to evaluate the extent of the damage and make plans for the repairs which would be needed. The flight deck, aft of the forward elevator, was completely demolished. It had sagged and buckled from the heat and the force of explosions from above and below. The wood planking was char. These gun mounts tell their own story. Under escort, we were on our way back to Pearl Harbor. From certain angles, the old girl didn't look bad. Her masts were askew, but she knifed through the water with some of her old spirit. All the while, debris was being jettisoned. Anything that could be moved was given the heave hole. Pearl Harbor again. It's hard to remember that we entered this same channel only two months ago. We were on our way west then. Again, we were greeted by the same group of waves. The banner was canted, and it waved over more rust than paint, but it was still there. She sailed 102,000 combat miles, and by all the rules they use in this game, she should be sleeping on the bottom off the coast of Japan. But some people don't believe in all the rules. Ten days later, on the 9th of April, the Franklin entered the Panama Canal. Needless to say, there were decorations and citations to be given out. But the Purple Heart Awards had to be delayed until the Franklin reached the canal zone. The supply at Pearl Harbor was not large enough to go around. Journey's end. 704 men sailed her 13,000 miles, the most heavily damaged warship ever to reach port under her own power. In New York Bay, the Whistle Brigade, from deep-throated liners to the family motorboat, screeched a welcome to one of the Navy's great fighting ladies in all her rusty and battered dignity.
final presentation of medals and awards was held on what was left of the flight deck. This was probably the most decorated crew that ever sailed a Navy ship. Every military honor within the power of a grateful people to bestow was worn by these men. If you ever meet a crewman of the Franklin, you'll know he belonged to that band of heroes who brought a lost ship back to port. Months pass, and in one of the huge hospitals where the Navy's hurt ships go, a transformation is wrought which proves beyond all doubt how tough and durable are the vessels that guard our ramparts. Rehabilitated from her broad bows to her broader stern, from her keel to the towering top of her fighting island amidships, the Franklin rides proud and whole once more. A fierce phoenix risen from her ashes, her guns and machinery sealed against inaction, but ready on short notice to defend the peace they so gallantly won through war. Probably Admiral Halsey was thinking of the Franklin when he said, we who had the privilege of serving in and with the flat tops of our Navy and knew the men who fought and lived them shall forever honor their bravery and achievements. A ship that won't be sunk can't be sunk. <laughs> <laughs>